Have you ever wondered how a nation could possibly lose a war against birds, not just any birds, but emus? Today, we delve into one of history's most unusual conflicts, the Emu War. Picture this. Australia, the early 1930s. The vast, sun-baked expanses of Western Australia serve as the unlikely battlefield for this peculiar war. The key players? The proud nation of Australia, a horde of feathered foes known as the Emus and the Royal Australian Artillery. The Emu War wasn't a metaphorical war, nor a war in name only. It was, quite literally, a military operation against emus that had become a nuisance to local farmers. An operation that, against all odds, saw the emus emerge victorious. As we delve into this tale of feathers, frustration and firepower, one question lingers in the air. But how did it all begin? Let's travel back to 1932. The year is 1932, Australia is in the grip of the Great Depression. In the vast expanses of Western Australia, a different sort of crisis is brewing. An unexpected foe is on the rise, the emu. These large, flightless birds native to Australia have seen their populations surge in the aftermath of a particularly wet season. With an estimated population of over 50,000, these birds begin to encroach upon human settlements. Here's where the plot thickens. The emus, in their search for food and water, start to invade the farmlands. The fertile wheat fields, the lifeline for many farmers already grappling with the economic downturn, become a buffet for these large birds. From dawn till dusk, the emus feed on the crops, leaving behind a trail of devastation and pushing the farmers to the brink of desperation. The farmers, many of whom are World War I veterans, are no strangers to conflict. They band together determined to protect their livelihoods but soon realize that they are ill-equipped to handle the scale of the emu invasion. They turn to the Australian government pleading for intervention. Their pleas do not fall on deaf ears. The government, recognizing the gravity of the situation, makes an unprecedented decision. It decides to deploy the military to tackle the emu problem. The 7th Heavy Battery of the Royal Australian Artillery is dispatched to the affected areas armed with Lewis guns light machine guns typically used in warfare. In the eyes of the government this is a two-pronged solution. Not only would it help protect the farmers and their crops, but it would also provide a means of culling the burgeoning emu population. Little did they know however that they were about to embark on one of the most bizarre chapters in military history. Thus the stage was set for an unusual war, a war against emus. And st with the decision made, soldiers moved into the Wheat Belt region, and the battle began. This was not a conventional war, but rather a war against flightless birds, the emus. The Australian soldiers armed with their Lewis guns were prepared to cull the emus that were causing havoc to the local farmers. The first operation kicked off in October, under the lead of Major GPW Meredith of the 7th Heavy Battery of the Royal Australian Artillery. The soldiers were confident, ready to show the emus who the real rulers of the land were. But these were no ordinary foes. With their swift speed and unpredictable movements, the emus proved to be more challenging adversaries than anticipated. Their initial strategy was simple, wait for the emus at a local dam where they would come to drink, but nature had other plans. A rainfall caused the emus to scatter, making them difficult targets. The soldiers tried to herd the emus into a suitable shooting range, but the birds outmaneuvered them, dispersing and running in all directions. The soldiers were left firing at fleeting shadows, their bullets barely making an impact. Frustration began to mount as the days passed. The emus were elusive, their numbers seemed unending, and the soldiers' ammunition was dwindling. The effectiveness of the military intervention was being questioned. Were the soldiers and their machine guns really losing to a bunch of birds? The first operation ended in disappointment. Despite firing thousands of rounds, only a few hundred emus were killed. A far cry from the estimated 20,000 that roamed the region. The farmers' problems were far from over, and the soldiers had to face the reality of their situation. The emus were not just birds, they were survivors, perfectly adapted to the harsh Australian outback. They were fast, they were tough, and they were smart. The soldiers had underestimated their enemy, and they paid the price. Despite their best efforts, the soldiers were not prepared for what they were up against. This was not the end however. The battle was just beginning, and the war against the emus was far from over. The soldiers would need to regroup, rethink their strategies, and prepare for round two. Undeterred, the Australian forces regrouped and resumed the offensive. 
This time, they came prepared, equipped with a new strategy and a renewed determination to tackle the Emu menace. The second operation was launched with a more tactical approach, employing lessons learned from the previous skirmish. Military tactics were used, adapting warfare strategies to the peculiarities of the situation. Soldiers were distributed strategically across the vast expanse of Western Australia, with the intention of cornering these flightless birds. They employed a pincer movement, a classic military maneuver, hoping to herd the emus into a trap. But, as it turns out, emus are not your typical enemy. The emus, with their inherent survival instincts, continued to evade capture. They split into small groups, making it difficult for the forces to launch a coordinated attack. Their ability to run at high speeds and blend into the landscape posed a formidable challenge. It seemed as though these birds, usually considered docile, had turned into elusive guerrilla fighters overnight. Meanwhile, the public watched in disbelief as their government waged war against birds. The media coverage was relentless and criticism of the government began to mount. The unusual war was seen as a waste of resources with many questioning the rationale behind it. Newspaper headlines screamed of the fiasco and editorial cartoons lampooned the situation, adding fuel to the fire of public opinion. As the war dragged on, the voices of dissent grew louder. People began to question the government's priorities, and the war against emus was widely seen as a distraction from more pressing issues. The citizens demanded answers, and the government found itself in a tight spot unable to justify the escalating costs of the operation. Amidst growing public scrutiny and relentless emus, the government found itself in a predicament. The war had become a public relations disaster and the emus, far from being defeated, seemed to be thriving. The operation which had begun with a roar was now whimpering to an end. In the face of public scrutiny and persistent emus, the government was forced to call off the operation. This marked the end of one of the most unusual chapters in military history leaving behind a trail of questions and a flock of victorious emus. So, what happens when humans go to war with emus and lose? The aftermath of the emu war was as unique as the conflict itself. In its wake, public policy regarding emu populations underwent a drastic change. Instead of treating them as enemies, the emus were now seen as an integral part of the ecosystem, their numbers managed with a more thoughtful approach. The emu war, in all its absurdity, carved out a peculiar niche in the annals of history. It's a tale that seems too strange to be true, yet it carries with it potent lessons. It serves as a testament to the unpredictability of nature and the folly of underestimating one's opponent, however unlikely they may seem. This war, against a flightless bird no less, also reminds us of the importance of coexistence and respect for all living beings. In the grand scheme of things, the Emu War serves as a reminder that not all conflicts can be solved with force. Sometimes the most unlikely opponents can teach us the most valuable lessons, 